thank you for the for the introduction and uh, for having me here. It's uh, it's good to be here. Um, it's good to be to have been associated with the the review, um, having some of my work in it. I mean, it's like a big deal uh, when you're a poet to get in there, and when you're not in there, you keep wondering who are the idiots that run that thing. <laughs> And then when you get in, you think, these guys are amazing, yeah. <laughs> truly brilliant. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to do a bunch of poems. Um, the poems come out of, for the most part, I think I'll be reading poems from City of Bones, uh, which is my most recent collection of poems, uh, which is published by Northwestern. And um, City of Bones, briefly, is a poems in conversation with the African-American playwright, the late August Wilson. Um, and simply put, I, I became f very fascinated with Wilson's work almost 20 odd years ago. Uh, I had a chance to meet him, which was wonderful. Um, but, I, but after a while, I began to think of Wilson as as iconic as a playwright um, in that he embarked on a project which was to write a play for each decade of the 20th century, um, chronicling essentially the African-American experience, which, in, which turns out to be a chronicling of, of, of the essence of American experience. Uh, the, the essence of American experience because it is, as W.B. Du Bois argues, that the race issue, the race, the understanding of our racial uh, conundrum in America is would be the topic and the theme of the 20th century. Uh, du Bois was wrong because he said it will stop at the end of the 20th century, but obviously it's still going on. Um, so, so Wilson, Wilson, I thought, but wrote these amazing plays. Uh, they're beautiful plays. And my feeling was that I would treat Wilson in the way that sometimes we treat uh, Shakespeare or Moliere or any, any other iconic artist that gives us ways to echo back, to argue, to con have conversation with, and to, to, to steal all that good stuff from, uh, because that's really the use of dead artists, that we can steal from them and get credit for doing so. <laughs> Um, but I'm going to begin with a small conversation I had recently with Ilya Kaminsky. And Ilya is, is, a, is a good friend, he's a remarkable poet. Um, and it, I wrote to Ilya, and I, we were having this conversation, and I said, I think it's a deeply complex problem of a society at all levels that constructs its sense of morality around the myth of its making. We're talking about truth. And I, I was arguing that one of the complex problems of American society is that we construct our sense of morality around the myth of our making, the myth of the founding of this nation. And, and by myth, I mean both the rationale for it as well as the lie of it, the truth and the lie of it. Myth functions in both ways, as, as, as you know. Ilya's response is interesting. He says, I agree, of course, it's a curious thing. We are being told over and over, and I myself actually believe it, that poetry is not information, not about the event. It is the event. And that language is a living organism. That story is secondary, and so on. I believe all that wholeheartedly. I'm with Adelia Prado, that beautiful Brazilian poet, when she says, narrative is the excrement of time. And yet, here we are in America that is built on the denial of its own story, of what it's done, and we see how the whole around which the whole nation is built eats up the nation. It's like a rust eating up the whole wall. And our poets keep talking about beauty. But what the hell is this beauty if it denies death that happened and is just there like a cherry on top of a fancy cake? Decorative, so much of it. Just lifeless and decadent. Touch my finger on the golden pen, the golden pen. 
the golden pen. Touch my finger on the golden pen and write my name up there. Crossroads. Lie down, lie down, and live as quiet as a bone. Dylan Thomas, once below a time. This is the dark time of Babylon, tawny prairie lands, dull with light snow, the sky heavy with gloom. My mornings continue the nightmare of cold eating away at the rack of my body, so dry, so bleak, so complete. The devil is at the crossroads. Would have preferred to meet my panting father, his eyes so long emptied of hope. He couldn't even get drunk right. How they made him like this, his last dream blighted by the thud on his flimsy wall. The foreman's bark, the burden of cotton, the truth that there is nothing but a breast emptiness to his life caged in the limits of his district, caged by the rituals of burying the dead long before they have died, caged by the hunger of children. Good God, even the nastiest sinner knows not to get drunk in the steamed up chapel where Jesus promises a party in the hereafter. I wish it was my papa with his big hands, with his fist full of his fat dick asking me if I have a problem, if he can taste some of my girl's cream. Maybe find his way to heaven before I do, and he beat me off her, dropped his overalls, and made her go mute in dust beneath the towering elms, the horse scrawny as these bodies of ours, ritualizing the way a man becomes a man. I had to whip him, had to beat on him had to make blood come from my father's head, had to watch him crawl up against the tree, look at me, tell me he will never see me no more, never feed me no more, like it was the biggest relief of his life, like he had been waiting all his life to cut me off of him for good. And that girl, gathering her things, told me to stay and make it right. She said it would be foolish to starve over some country pussy. It ain't nothing, she said. Just plain stupid to think a nigger girl needs a hero like I ain't never been screwed by Satan looking for some heaven in this ragged edge of life. I wish it was my daddy at the crossroads waiting for me. But he wasn't there. It was just the devil. And he got mad because I wasn't scared of him. And I told him to do his worst. What can a fool do to me in this cold place where everything is dark and home don't have a sound no more? So tired, dear God. I'm so damn tired deep down in my bones. I'm so tired of walking hard. So tired of walking through this Babylon land. Death, Baron Samdi. Baron Samdi is a, a Haitian deity in the Vodun belief system. And he dresses very well. First, your dog dies, and you pray for the Holy Spirit to raise the inept lump in the sack. But Jesus' name is no magic charm, sunsets and the flies are gathering. That is how faith dies. By dawn, you know death, the way it arrives and then grows silent. Death wins. So you walk out of the tangle of thorny weeds behind the barn and you coax a black cat to your fingers. You let it lick milk and spit from your hand before you squeeze its neck until it messes itself. It claws, tearing your skin, its eyes growing into saucers. A dead cat is light as a life cat and not stiff, not yet. You grab its tail and fling it as far as you can. 
the crows find it first. By then the stench of the hog pens hides the canker of death. Now you know the power of death that you have it, that you can take life in a second and wake the same the next day. Thus, this is why you can't fear death. You've seen the broken neck of a man in a well. You know who pushed him over the lip of the well, tumbling down. You know all about the blood on the ground. You know that a dead dog is a dead cat is a dead man. Now you look at a white man in the face. You talk to him about cotton prices and the cost of land. Laugh your wide open mouth, laugh in his face. And he knows one thing about you, that you know the power of death. And you will die as easily as live. This is how a man seizes what he wants, how a man turns the world over in dreams, eats a solid meal and waits for death to come like nothing, like the open sky, like light at early morning, like a man in a red pinstripe trousers, a black top hat, a yellow scarf, and a kerchief dipped in eau de cologne to cut through the stench coming from his mouth. It's all troublesome poems, aren't they? It 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 doesn't get better. I mean, it's not like <laughs> it's pretty pretty grim all the way through. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what God says in the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. I always found that a handy scripture. <laughs> what you don't know is that when you lay out on your back, sweet with good liquor, as you like to call it, and your face goes slack, every strain to be the man drained from your forehead, and I pull off your boots, the socks with the hole in the right instep that I have darned already and will again, and then undo those buttons on your trousers, untangle the belt and pull down those trousers, heavy as the five-year-old I cradled in my arms, full of coins, your knife, bundles of paper wrapped with blackened cord. When I strip off your shorts, then unbutton your shirt, pulling you to one side, then to the other to take your arms out of the sleeves, then dragging that cotton shirt stained on under the armpits yellow over your head to leave you laid out there like I know you will be that day when Palmer will wash you to fix you up with his chemicals and paste and makeup. Palmer who will not know every fold under your chin or the way that long vein crawls over your thick arms down to your wrist, your thick arms down to your wrist. Palmer and his people who don't know the shape of your chest hard at the top and soft around those nipples you pretend you don't like me to suckle on like a baby, even though I can feel the nudge of your dick every time I do. Folks who won't know every dark spot on your skin, the islands of scars over your whole wide belly, stretched tight over the groups of muscle barely visible beneath the flesh. Folks who don't know to find the cluster of dense hair on your left shoulder, who won't know what it is to lay hands on you like a prayer and say, man, God say all of this, all of this is mine. Every inch of skin, every hair is mine. They won't know what I know when I place my hand over your scrotum and feel the animal of you grow hard, grow to the shame, I, the shape I know, each swell, each vein, each wrinkle and blemish. And me saying, even this man is mine. Even when I can smell the funk of another woman in your skin, even when I know you don't know that it is all mine, even then, I still stand over you, place my hand over your chest and put my face against your face, feel the breath of you on me. And in this silence, I say to you, man, this is mine. And today, I won't take it away from you. Today, I won't cover your slack face with this pillow because of love, man, because of love and because God says. A cautionary tale. <laughs> 
for the prudent. <laughs> Guys, I mean, you know, I don't mean. <laughs> <laughs> This is going to be a series of sonnets called What Ola Says. It's not a whole lot more to go, so relax. It's going to be fine. And then we'll, <laughs> and then we'll have a Q&A after, and then I'm, more, I'm far more animated and entertaining then. Um, so, so this is a series called What Ola Says. By the way, all of these poems are conversations with um, the work of Langston, of, of, of August Wilson. And, and I say that at this juncture because you've heard poems that could sound like my life and my story. Well, that's the beauty of this game that I play. Uh, so you don't know, you, you're not sure, and that's the deal. Uh, could be me all through, and then again, it could be just one of Wilson's characters. <laughs> Or both, both, both is good. Okay, so what Ola says. Ola is uh, a character that I bring back and forth, and there's a, there's a woman in one of Wilson's plays called, um, uh, oh gosh, I forget the name of the play, but she's, she's, a, she's a 300 year old woman, right? Is, isn't that a great idea? <laughs> It's gem of the ocean, right? And she's just a regular woman. She walks around, but she's 300 years old. So she, and she has a great memory. You see what happens there? That's brilliant. All right. What Ola says, one, starvation. This enterprise is built on the ingenuity of starvation. Hunger is the ordering truth of any good plantation. No mystery to this. Give one Negro something and the other nothing, and soon a society is built on need. There are four angels in the field. Run away, and you will see how quickly Black Angel will tell the white man where you went and how it is the order of starvation. They made monsters of us, and the red raw flesh of our betrayals is how they stayed on top. I sing songs of love, teaching us a common language our only healing. Two, 1838, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort, Psalm 23. It comes to us in whispers and the relay of news from town to town somewhere Negroes like us were waking early in the morning with no sound of the overseer's bellow with no ring of the iron pot to make them labor to fill the white man's coffers. Somewhere they've cut off the draining of blood, the bite of despair riding us, chattel, slave, property no more. The English said, stop, let the niggers have their own names. But here in these states of freedom, up in the righteous north, we must wear the shame of bondsmen. Is this how wicked God is? Where, O oh love, is Moses' rod? 1838 is when the English, you, you know, story, right? Ended slavery, blah, blah, blah. Haiti. They say it was a lie. They say it wasn't. Men with Africa in their bones who faced the bayonet cannon, guns bursting from the phalanx of white soldiers, gray-faced and troubling. But we heard the news in the wind of how they sprinted forward Yoruba songs in their throats, how they flew over open fields and turned those cowards into bloody red carcasses for freedom. They stole it, raised it high, frightening the lie of helplessness we've come to own. Oh, Toussaint, oh, brother Bookman, come up here to Alabama, teach us the words you used to smash through their evil world. Four, Stono's ghosts. Here they come floating in the mist, floating because their last breaths were taken, feet dangling, bound up wrists, pulled at their backs, kicking ugly deaths, 
But here they come dancing through the trees, 92 of them with eyes on fire, wondering whether that old humming of bees in their heads saying freedom has died to silence or whether we made it home to Spanish Florida before the crossing to Africa. How to tell them the dumb gods have stayed silent, all of them sleeping. How to say the auction block is still warm with the feet of new slaves facing old storms. Five, a woman's curse. Now, women forget all those things they don't want to remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. Zora Neale Hurston, their eyes were watching God. When you've lost track of your years and only seasons and the body's changes make sense to you, it's hard to lie that this woman's remembering is hers to stop and start as she wants to. So hard now to conjure up the salt smell of my mother's skin when she returned weary from the fields, the melody and the swell of her voice deep in the night to carry away from me the fear of the siren of insects of the morning in the dark forest around us. I try to return to my tongue the wrecked language that I used to know, but all I have is the rust of forgetting in me. Sometimes I have prayed to forget the blood and all I see before me is red. Sweetness. Some things won't lose their sweetness. It's true. The wash of light at the back of my neck when the Holy Spirit comes brightly in view. And the body, this body breaks like an insect drunk with the last spasms of fornicating before it slips into the wind happy as leaves. Such sweetness stays on my skin even when it's dying, it's drying to a toughness with grief. Because a body doesn't forget its birthing, the flare of nerves trying to make flesh from flesh. God gave us these things between our legs so ugly they wake only laughter and shining in you to beat back the sad song to beat back the blues. And book, they send me to the kitchen, they send me to eat in the kitchen. Langston Hughes, I too. It took me 100 years to read a book and now I'm seeking 100 years of what was stolen from me. Those old crooks stole my language, stole my name, didn't care that all they gave me was a bad feeling and an ocean of emptiness spread before me. But what they stole was what was hidden in these words. They stole a universe, a sea of stories, worlds and worlds I never knew could be sitting there beside me, cool, silent, before I could eat up each clue to the impossible. This is what they stole for a hundred years. I will devour it all. Now watch me growing fat and tall, tall. Okay, two more poems. And then we'll talk. Well, one more poem, actually. One more poem. So this is a poem for um, two more poems. This is a poem. <laughs> these are two poems, both for my, um, for my wife, Lorna. Uh, this is in this saying. One, there's a way to end books. The gathered papers, their weighty gift, the clean parade of words in columns of paragraphs and in columns of images. The tidiness of things, the numbered and numbered, they form the thing you have labored over for years. To end a book, you tie a blue ribbon around the heft, make a bow, kiss it. Two. The way to end the year of cataclysms is to find a piece of land by water where old boats rot at the edges. And the place smells of ancient things, sulfur, salt, rotting fish, and deep musk of mud and grass. To then sit on a moving jetty, rocking against the universe's pulse, and there wait for the moon. Three. To end this way alone is to end with the hollow melancholy of loss and regret. Better to end with the voice of your woman, for you will need that voice ordinary as way, rain, walking, talking your name. Perhaps it is the intrusion of her scent filling the air or the cool of her touch slick with tomato pulp and herbs. For I know the gender of this poem, do not worry. It is because I know the name of the bodies standing in the dusk by water. 
Kwame and Lorna. They will hold hands, and in this saying, the poem ends. And finally, than we can bear. We could have faced that lasting wound, the rupture of blame and illogical blame, the brokenness of our sorrow. It is crass to think of these mercies when there are those who have lost their children, but you and I were given these three beauties, these walking melodies of our love, flawed and stammering as it has been, as it will be, but love we could never create in us, love that hurts, that fills our emptiness, that promises that in the village someone knows our names, someone owns us. This is the love you give me, your half smile seeing me in an open plaza saying, you look just then like you did in chapel gardens, the walk, the limp, I say, you limp then? You laugh, I've always limped. I never knew that, I just liked your walk. Our lives are crowded with needs. Shadows do gather and sometimes we choose silence, a numb void instead of the risk of memory. But today I think in the strange tearful way of a body filled with Neruda's noisy rivers rushing through like light, it is mercy that saved us from the breaking that would have come upon us. They lived, they grew, they remain. And you and I, we have this impossible love in this, in them, in us. Let's call it for the motto it is, the promise it is, not more than we can bear, not more than we can bear, my love. I give you this, reaching as I am to believe, always making a way out, always made a way out, a way to bear it all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.